Om Gyanam Chimarandasya Gyanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshur Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Yajananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We have some topics today that those of you who have read Nectar Devotion and studied it and remember it may find familiar. And we're going to see how far we get today. We have on the menu the five potent forms, especially potent forms of bhakti and also the nine symptoms of ecstatic love for Krishna. Let's see how far we get today because as I prepared for this seminar, I saw the depths just becoming deeper and deeper. So first of all, let me ask you all how many are very familiar with the section of Nectar Devotion, the five potent practices of bhakti. Raise your hand. Oh, <laughs> very good. Thank you for, your, for giving me that clarity. We're going to use as our theme, our resounding theme in this morning session, a verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita. And I'd like to explain to you all why there is such a correlation between Chaitanya Charitamrita and Nectar Devotion. As some of you may know, Nectar Devotion is Srila Prabhupada's summary study of the Vaishnava classic text, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Rupa Goswami. So I hope to show you the correlation, the connection between Chaitanya Charitamrita and Nectar Devotion or Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. In this way, my goal is that you'll see how authorized and scientific is the process of bhakti. Last night, in this same building, we had a program aimed at an audience that was not so familiar with the length and breadth of the Bhakti Ocean. And we were consoling them that they don't have to fear. Bhakti is not a belief based. position for you to take. Generally, people think of religion as belief. Well, I believe this. What do you believe? And if they want to be very liberal and open-minded, they'll say to you, well, tell me about your belief system. <laughs> I've got my belief system. Everyone has a belief system. Bhakti is far beyond the belief system. And I hope to impress that upon you as we discuss the five potent forms of devotional service. These activities of devotional service are called angas. And so today we're going to be discussing the pancha angas, the five main activities. This is all coming from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his instruction to Rupa Goswami 
and Sanatan Goswami. So in case you're wondering about the source of all this devotional information, it is coming from the Supreme Personality of God in Himself, coming as His own devotee, appearing as His own devotee, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The scene, which we'll discuss more later because I think it's very important. The scene is in Prayag, at a place called the Dashashvameda Ghat. And there, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is instructing Rupa Goswami for 10 straight days, giving Rupa Goswami, as we'll find out later, the basic outline of the whole ocean of devotion. And then he'll ask Rupa Goswami, you please drill down more in your explication, in your presentation. Take the themes I'm giving you and expand upon them. So that's what Rupa Goswami does in Nectar of Devotion. It's coming all in, as a seed, it's coming from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the theme that I like to keep resonating in your consciousness is this concise statement by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's very, it's a very easy verse to memorize. It's in Bengali, but Bengali is very easy. It's quite a bit like Sanskrit. So, we're going to read a summary of these five most potent forms of bhakti. Sadhu Sangha Nama Kirtam Bhagavad Shravam Mathura Vasa Sri Muktira Shradaya Sevam Repeat, Sadhu Sangha, Nama Kirtan, Bhagavat Shravan, Matura Vasa, Sri Murti, Shradaya Seva. So, Sadhu Sangha refers to association with devotees, number one. Number two, Nama Kirtan. Chanting the holy name. Number three, Bhagavat Shravan, hearing Shrimad Bhagavatam. Matura Vasa, number four, living at Madura. Matura includes Vrindavan. Sri Murtira Shraddhaya Sevan, worshiping the deity with faith and veneration. So Mahaprabhu is speaking. One should associate with devotees, chant the holy name of the Lord, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, reside at Madhura, and worship the deity with faith and veneration. These five limbs of devotional service are the best of all. Even a slight performance of these five awakens love for Krishna. So please keep this in mind. <laughs> These five items have previously been mentioned, but they're being repeated. You see, before we get to this point of the focus, the spotlight on these five activities, you should know that Rupa Goswami gives a list of 64 items of devotional service. These are taken from a work by Sanatana Goswami called Hari Bhakti Vilas, in which innumerable bhakti items are presented. But Rupa Goswami, the brother of Sanatana Goswami, has taken 64. They're called angas or limbs of devotional service. Some of the angas, some of the limbs, 
refer to a complex of activities, just like worshiping the deity. Under the, or included in the limb of worshiping the deity is, are so many things. Stand up when a procession of the deity comes by. Don't do this before the deity. Do that before the deity. So some of the angas refer to a complex, a bundle of activities. Other of the 64 items that Rupa Goswami has selected refer to just a singular activity like Guru Padashraya, take shelter of a guru. There's no further um, items contained in, to form a bundle in reference to Guru Padashraya. Actually, when you look at this list of 64, you realize how scientific bhakti is because it includes items or activities that encompass all your body, mind, and sense activities. So bhakti, once again, is not about belief. You may believe this way, you may believe that way, but what are you doing with your mind, your body, and your senses? How are you going to spiritualize your mind, body, and senses? It's not a question of belief, it's a question of activity. Some of you may recall at the very beginning of Nectar of Devotion, it's pointed out that bhakti is not an armchair philosophy. Remember Bhagavad Gita, where is Krishna speaking to Arjuna? On a battlefield, the most active place you could think of. Because Krishna wants to make it clear that bhakti involves activity and senses sense activity. So it's very important that the process of devotional service includes the functioning of all your senses, your body and your mind. This is a, so different from just religious theology and religious belief. Unless you have the information as to what to do with your body, mind, and senses, how are you actually going to access the spiritual reality? You can't do it just by belief. So this is why Krishna, in the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita says, Raja Vijja, Raja Guya. This is the king of knowledge, most secret of all secrets. What's, what's the secret? the activities of the body and mind and senses in pure devotional service. That is the secret of all secrets. Activity, action items, not theological beliefs. And Krishna says, it's the perfection of dharma. Why? Sasukam kartam avayapriyaksha avadamam dharmyam. First of all, it gives direct perception. This bhakti dharma gives direct perception of the real self by experience, by realization. Sasukam kartam avyam. It is joyfully performed. It's inexhaustible. There's no limit to bhakti. You don't have to worry about mm, reaching the end of all the bhakti resources. <laughs> like fossil fuels or something. Everything about Krishna is inexhaustible and unlimited. I remember, I must confess, when I first started reading Srila Prabhupada's books, I was not going to any devotee gathering, any temple. I just, as many of you know, just loved the books and didn't want to associate with devotees. So I remember first reading about the spiritual world and I thought, 
I should, this, this sounds so wonderful. I should hurry up and go there before it gets overcrowded. <laughs> <laughs> and I must mention the other thing I thought of when reading Prabhupada's books, all on my own, no devotee sangha. I kept reading about offering your food and then honoring the remnants. So I thought, well, I took the literal English meaning of remnants, what's left over. So I thought, who's going to do this? You cook up a pot of food, and then you offer it, and then you throw out the food and whatever clings to the bottom of the pot. The remnants, that's what you take. That's what I thought. I said, I'm never doing this. <laughs> that shows you how we need the association of devotees. So we want to be clear that your involvement in bhakti it means a systematic program for engaging your mind, body, and senses in activity. So Rupa Goswami has selected five of the 64 items as super special. And he's glorifying those five items because this is what Lord Chaitanya has done. We'll continue. If your bhakti life is full of those five items, then you are successful. This is the wealth. This is the property that you're after. This is the investment property that should dominate your life. These five items. Sadhu Sangha, association with devotees. Nama Kirtan, chanting Hare Krishna. Bhagavat Shravan, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam with attention and submission. Matura Vasa, living in a holy place, which can actually be Vrindavan, Navadweep, or Jagannath Puri. Sri Mortira, worshiping the deity with faith and veneration. How is your life containing those five items. This is our point we want you to focus on in this morning session. If you can understand the importance of these five items, you'll see how Srila Prabhupada has built up the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He's built up a multinational organization that profusely offers, abundantly offers, these five most potent forms of devotional service. So that's what's going on at the Radha Gopinath Mandir. You see, there's opportunity to associate with devotees, there's chanting of Hare Krishna, there's he attentive hearing, at least opportunity to hear Bhagavatam attentively. And you say, well, what about living in a holy place? Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> this is a mystical point that Srila Prabhupada explained in Melbourne during his visit in 1976. He explained that for those absorbed in Mandir Seva, serving in the Mandir. If they're thinking, everything I'm doing is for Krishna's pleasure, they're not in Sydney. In the case he was, in that case, he was talking about Melbourne. This is not Melbourne. This is Vaikuntha. And then he went further. This is Goloka Vrindavan. If you have the attitude that you simply want to satisfy Krishna and that Krishna is the enjoyer, 
you're not in any mundane city. So that shows you the peak potential of Matura Vasa. Shula Prabhupada was very firm about that. This is not Melbourne. If you have this attitude, if you have this kind of Krishna consciousness, you are not in Melbourne. You are in Goloka Vrindavan. If everything you do is for Krishna's pleasure according to Krishna's desire. Now let's look at nectar of devotion. But before we get there, let's hear Lord Chaitanya's verdict about the five potent forms, most potent forms of devotional activity. Mahaprabhu is underlining, he's saying, the power of these five principles is very wonderful and difficult to understand. Can you see that? It's difficult to understand because you might just take it as just no big deal. My grandmother did this in Gujarat. <laughs> <laughs> Hindu granny wisdom. <laughs> just cultural artifacts, cultural activities, tradition. But no, take it from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The power of these five principles is very wonderful and difficult to understand. Even without faith in them, a person who is offenseless can awaken his dormant love of Krishna simply by being a little connected with them. This is a verse for those of you who like Shastric details and information, this is the verse from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Duru had bhuta viryasmin, shatha dure stupanchake, yatra sopo pisambhanda, sadhyam baba janmane. Just a little bit of connection. If someone doesn't make offenses, even though they may not have faith in these five potent forms of devotional service, they can still awaken their dormant love for Krishna. Offenses, that's the key. As we progress in bhakti, we want to become more and more mindful of all the various kinds of offenses. That means you're becoming sensitive in a relationship with Krishna. When someone is becoming dear to you, you want to make sure that you're not doing anything that rubs them the wrong way. So as a devotee progresses in bhakti, he or she wants to make sure I'm not committing offenses. Because even someone who has no faith in these five potent forms can awaken the dormant love for Krishna if there are no offenses. So what to speak of someone who has faith in these five potent forms and who has daily immersion in these five potent forms. So you might say, well, what's happening with us then? What's going on? We have faith in these five activities and we're very much connected to them, we think, at least once a week. And so, where's our dormant love of Krishna? <laughs> Offenses. And nectar devotion will educate you about the offenses. There's Nam Aparad, offenses to the holy name. There's Seva Aparad, offenses to the deity. Vaishnav Aparad, offenses to devotees. As we advance in bhakti, just like in any relationship, you want to become more and more conscious of how to please the beloved and how not to irritate the beloved. So this is Krishna consciousness. 
to be conscious of what gives Krishna pleasure and what does not give Krishna pleasure. This is relationship common sense. So using the contemporary vocabulary, the more you give these five items quality time, the more wealthy your spiritual life becomes. So Mahaprabhu himself, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself is letting you know, yes, this is difficult to understand. Why? Because we take it for granted. Oh, chanting Hare Krishna is always happening. Someone's always doing it somewhere. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Well, it depends on who's giving class, whether I pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Worshipping the deity. Well, when the curtains are open, I'm very attentive. So on and so forth. We take these activities for granted because we think the main thing is what? I believe in Krishna. That's the main thing. And my parents, they believed in Krishna. So, there it is. No. <laughs> there it is not. Mm. A Vaishnav steadily seeks to increase the quantity of these five activities and their quality. In that way, you can judge how your spiritual life is developing. So again, remember that Srila Prabhupada has based ISKCON on these panchaangas, these five limbs. So ISKCON is not like some social club that you belong to. No, it is the devotional service entity that you participate in. So let's look at some of these. Well, we'll try to cover all these five items, especially as described in Nectar Devotion. First of all, deity worship. Sri Murti. Sri Murti Seva. You would be surprised perhaps to know that in Nectar of Devotion, when Srila Prabhupada discusses that particular form of devotional service, service to the deity, he is mainly talking about deities at home. Let's hear about it. You would be surprised. You would think he would be mainly, he should be talking about deities in the temple. <laughs> but no. And we'll elaborate on this because I think it's very important for you. We want to make this seminar practical for your everyday situation. Certainly I could talk about very intricate bhakti items and, but I want to make sure that you have something you can take home with you that you can apply in your practical situation. So let's listen. First of the pancha anga is deity worship. The purport of this verse is that if someone becomes attached to Sri Murti or the deity of Krishna by worshiping at home, then he will forget his relationships of so-called friendship, love, and society. Thus, it is the duty of every householder to install deities of the Lord at home and to begin the process of worshiping along with all of his family members. This will save everyone from such unwanted activities as going to clubs, cinemas, and dancing parties. <laughs> and smoking, drinking, and so forth. All such nonsense will be forgotten if one stresses the worship of the deities at home. All right, how many of you go to clubs, cinemas, and dancing parties? Raise your hand. <laughs> no. <laughs> we won't ask about smoking and drinking. 
<laughs> but know that all such nonsense will be forgotten if one stresses the worship of the deities at home. So now you're saying, wait a minute, we thought deity worship is something that's done in the temple, in the mandir. Yes, but there is a difference between the archana, the worship at the temple, and generally what goes on in a householder's home if family has deities at home. Let me explain. Traditionally, maybe a hundred years ago or so, in wealthy Indian families, there was always, a t in their palatial home, there was always a small temple with deities. And all the family members, Srila Prabhupada talks about this from his youth at the beginning of the 20th century, all the family members would come to Mangalarti in their home temple every morning. And if one of them was late, he or she had to pay a fine to the deity. <laughs> that, so Prabhupada explained that's the way a very cultured family would operate. We have a different situation these days. You know how life is in Sydney better than I. No time for anything. <laughs> and we're so happy if our members will chant 16 rounds, especially if they're able to do that before going to work. But it's a struggle, I know. Life in the world today, in the big city means a different mantra than the Hare Krishna mantra. It means time, money, time, money, money, time, money, time. Time, money, time, money, time, money, money, time, money, time. Never enough of either, right? Especially as I've been speaking at some of our programs we've had the past two weeks. Sydney is now certified as the number two most expensive place for accommodation in the world. It's up there at the top with Hong Kong and Vancouver. So you've got to scramble. How can you have time for full deity worship at home? This is why the mandir becomes even more important. Because when you come to the mandir at least once a week, then you can see the full deity worship program, something you could never do at home. I remember in the 70s in Los Angeles, at that temple community, which occupied many buildings in a neighborhood, there was a controversy amongst the grihastas about why should I cross the street to the temple to see the deities, Rukmini Thorkadi, when I have in my apartment, my flat, I've got my own little deities. So the controversy reached Srila Prabhupada, who said that, all right, if in your home puja, you are following the same exact standard as the archana, the puja in the temple, then you can stay home. Now, we all know about the puja at the temple. How many offerings a day? Seven. Seven, Seven offerings a day. How many times to close our chains? Twice a day. How many artis? Seven. Some say seven, five, some say five. In any case, can you do that at home? No. <laughs> Every day, bathing, dressing, go with the prayers. So Srila Prabhupada's point was that if you can make your home puja the same level as what goes on in the temple, then you can say, I have my deities at home, there's no need for me to attend the temple. 
But how many of you can do that? <laughs> so, am I saying you can't have any deities at home? Did I say that? The most effective deity worship, many senior devotees like me agree, the most effective home deity worship is worshiping Sri Sri Gore and Thai. They accept no offenses and they are pleased simply by your chanting and dancing in front of them. That's the main puja for Sri Sri Gore and Thai. But often I hear that devotees, they think, oh, Gornitai is kind of ordinary. We need Baal Gopal. We need Sri Sri Radha Krishna. <laughs> we need Lagu Gopal. We need this. We need that. All right. But just understand that most senior Vaishnavas agree with them that the most effective deities for home worship are Sri Sri Gornitai. And through them, everything comes. That is the most effective way in this age of health. So you make, you can't do seven artis a day, and two dressings, and five or seven offerings. But what you can do is chant Hare Krishna in front of Sri Sri Gaurantai. And that way you get everything. So yes. Life is much different in Sydney now than it was in India a hundred years ago. <laughs> Although that's changing very rapidly. Those of you who go back to India or who have relatives who work in India know there's no such thing as work-life balance. That's, a, that's an exotic concept. <laughs> It's becoming the same way here in Australia as an employer squeeze you tighter and tighter. I was talking to some devotees working in the corporate world. They told me they're, they're remote workers. They only go into the office once a week, but the whole day is filled with online meetings and then at 5 p.m. at the supposed end of the workday, that's when you get a chance to do your own work. It never ends. It's weekends and build up with work. So this is what the working world's becoming like. And as people become more and more desperate for employment, they'll have to settle for this. So how can they do elaborate TV worship at home unless they're very fortunate to have adequate resources, allowing so much time. But still, you can have Sri Sri Gornitai at home, offer your food to them, chant before them, gather the whole family for a short kirtan before them. So remember, this is why Srila Prabhupada, in Nectar Devotion, when it comes to the one of the five angas of bhakti, deity worship, he's talking about deity worship at home. So if you want to be saved from club cinemas and dancing parties, <laughs> whatever the contemporary equivalent of that is, if you want to be saved from social media, <laughs> if you want to be saved from the internet, then, <clears throat> All such nonsense will be forgotten if one stresses the worship of the deities at home. So Rupa Goswami is going to give you a very provocative incentive, motivation. He says, and he's written this verse himself. My dear friend, if you still have any desire to enjoy the company of your friends within this material world, then don't look upon the form of Krishna, who is standing on the bank of Keshiga. He is known as Govinda, and his eyes are very enchanting. He's playing upon his flute, 
and on his head there is a peacock feather and his whole body is illuminated by the moonlight in the sky. So he said, don't do it. If you want to be attached to mundane relationships, don't go see Krishna. This is a very artistic way of condemning what should be praised and praising what should be condemned. It sounds like he's praising mundane association but actually he's just glorifying Krishna in a reverse way. If you're at all attached to these things, I don't advise that you look at Krishna. I don't advise that you go see Krishna. Don't see his form. You'll forget about all those things you're attached to, and you don't want to do that. <laughs> Furthermore, when it when we discuss hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, we should understand that <clears throat> Bhagavatam is very mystical. By mystical, I mean that your immersion and realization that you get from Bhagavatam depends on what your motivation is. As you approach Bhagavatam, which is the literary incarnation of Krishna, Bhagavatam reciprocates with you. So, in other words, Srimad Bhagavatam is state-specific. According to your state of consciousness, when you read it, that's what you can understand. So, the Bhagavatam experience will be different for different persons. You may be a great academic scholar, but that doesn't mean you can enter into the mysteries of Bhagavatam. You may recall a verse from the first canto of Bhagavatam. Vasudeva Katha Ruchi San Mahat Sevaya Vipra. By Mahat Seva, by rendering service to the great devotee, you get a taste Ruchi, you get the taste for Vasudev Kata, talks about Vasudev, talks about the Supreme Personality of God. So this sounds strange to the mundane mind. What does it matter whether I serve something or someone or not? I've got my intellect, I've got my master's degree. I'm a powerful IT wallah. <laughs> if I can understand so many IT intricacies, why can't I understand Bhagavatam? <laughs> but no, Bhagavatam is spiritual substance of the highest order. So what does Rupa Goswami say in order to provoke you to approach Bhagavatam properly? He says, and I'm paraphrasing. Oh, foolish idiot! You have heard Srimad Bhagavatam, and now you're not paying any more attention to mundane activities. How could you have done this? <laughs> you're a fool. You've heard Srimad Bhagavatam, and now you've slackened your grip on all mundane activities. What's happening? <laughs> In other words, if you want to slacken your grip on mundane activities, here, Srimad Bhagavatam, you're very intelligent. But he's saying it in a very ornamental, uh, <laughs> fascinating way. <laughs> so he's emphasizing, seeing the Sri Murti of Radha and Krishna is to forget endeavors for material association. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam means you'll forget even Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, ordinary religion as Dharma, economic development as artha, kama, sense gratification, and you'll even forget about moksha, liberation. Because, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, premat pamato mahan, love of Krishna is the fifth category, beyond even moksha, beyond even liberation.
So Srimad Bhagavatam tells you right in the very beginning, it's sweeping out anything other than the desire to please Krishna. Dharma projita kaitavota paramo namatsarana satam. The Bhagavatam is for those who are pure in heart, who don't even hanker for liberation, for freedom from material existence. They're just hankering to please Krishna. So Bhagavatam sweeps out all of these extraneous motivations, even though they're in the Vedas, because Bhagavatam is the conclusion of the Vedas. The Bhagavatam is focused on pure love of Krishna, beyond material religiosity for material gain, beyond economic development, beyond sense gratification, and even beyond moksha, liberation. Sadhu Sangha, association with devotees. Nectar of devotion encourages you to associate with devotees who are favorable to your spiritual advancement. Because there can be neophyte devotees who, in the name of bhakti, encourage material activities. And that's not good. That kind of association is not good for your development in pure devotional service. This is a sensitive point because we don't want to be rude to anyone. We don't want to be harsh to anyone. At the same time, while respecting even someone who just chants Hare Krishna and has no good acha, has no good behavior, because they're chanting in your mind to respect them. But when it comes to rubbing shoulders with someone, associating with someone, you want inspiring association that will uplift you. So it's your responsibility as an individual devotee to somehow other arrange for yourself inspiring association. You'll become like whom you associate with. So yes, there are so many different levels of devotees with different degrees of commitment. But while respecting all, it is your responsibility to be selective when it comes for inspiration. And I think many of you have the experience of your spiritual life accelerating because you were very discriminating about your association. Yes, you would respect all, but when it comes to revealing your mind, opening your heart, inquiring about what can accelerate your bhakti and what can impede your bhakti, you want the kind of association that can motivate you properly and shine a light ahead of you so you can see where you're going. In other words, Sadhu Sangha doesn't mean just a social club for discussing mundane things, investment opportunities, visas, <laughs> how to pass the English test. <laughs> Those are practical necessities, but they are not related to Sadhu Sangha. And Mahaprabhu elsewhere in Chaitanya Charitamrita said, Lava Matra, just a fraction of a second with a real sadhu can bring about all perfection in your life. So that's how crucial association with devotees is. So again, remember our theme, Sadhu Sangha, Nama Kirtan, Bhagavat Shravan, Sri Muktira, what's next? Matura. Oh, Matura Vasa, Sri Muktira, Shraya Seva.
These five things are what you're after in ever increasing quantities because this is what is this is what forms the International Society for Christian Consciousness, these five activities. So the more, as we said, your individual life is full of these five things, these five items, the more successful in bhakti you are. So much so that even just focusing on one can bring you such great success. What to speak of connects you with all five. And Iskand gives you opportunity for all five. That's Srila Prabhupada's genius, a multinational entity advocating, presenting, facilitating the five most potent forms of devotional service. I want to leave some time for any questions. We're going to see how far we get today. We have an ambitious agenda. But this afternoon, I definitely want you to hear about the relationship between Lord Chaitanya and Rupa Goswami. And maybe we'll get to Sanatana Goswami also. So that you see where all this is coming from. What are the dynamics of the relationship? How does Lord Chaitanya relate to Rupa Goswami? How does he give him this knowledge? How does Rupa Goswami receive it? So I'd like to give that background information from Chaitanya Charitamrita. And another reason why I like to refer to Chaitanya Charitamrita is so that you will have it in your home. <laughs> How many of you have a set of Srimad Bhagavatam in your home? Raise your hand. All right. Now, <laughs> how many of you have Chaitanya Charitamrita in your home? A little less. Okay, better than I thought. Very good. All right, do we have any questions thus far? Yes. Thank you, Shmuel. You mentioned uh, during the talk that to approach Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, we have to be, we have to have purity. Um, to get the full benefit. Yeah. So my question was, um, we do have Srimad Bhagavatam, and because you instructed us with trying to uh, uh, read, all, and I speak for myself, definitely no purity. So how do we reconcile the two? Then? Keep reading with an attitude that you're begging Krishna, please grant me insight into this non-material literature, this literary incarnation of you. And gradually, by your reading of Bhagavatam, you'll make spiritual advancement. There'll be things you don't understand, there'll be things you think you understand, but don't. <laughs> and gradually, as you progress through the cantos, you're preparing for the smiling face of Krishna, which is the 10th canto. That's the objective of the first nine cantos, to get you ready for Krishna Leela. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, everything very nice. So my question is, uh, you mentioned about uh, Sadhu Sangha, Nandita, Bhagavad Shravan, everything. Uh, very nice, everything nice. My question is, so while uh, we want to maintain our uh, mood, proper mood, while reading Bhagavatam, while hearing Bhagavatam, while chanting, while uh, uh, associating with devotees, and while uh, taking dozen of the pages, we want to maintain our mood, but uh, something, something happens and mood goes off. So my question is, how can we maintain our mood uh, while doing this angels? That's why we're having this discussion, so that you focus on increasing your bhakti wealth. Focusing on these five activities, how to increase the quality of your engagement with them, will provide such benefits you can't imagine. 
especially as you become more and more aware of offenses. Because as we heard, even a person who has no faith, no understanding of these five potent activities, but doesn't make offenses, that person can advance in love of Krishna. What to speak of someone who has faith in these activities? Yes, this is my wealth, this is my life and soul, these five activities, pancha anga. So that's why we're having this seminar, so that you know what your real wealth is and how to increase it. And remember what we explained in the beginning. We're not dealing with religious belief here. We're not dealing with just empty traditions or superficial traditions. We are dealing with the life and soul of bhakti, these five angas. So if you want to increase your bhakti, how do you do it? By more believing? No, by more quantitative and qualitative immersion in these five activities. Um, does the devotional um, service um, increase belief as well? Yes, because the more you engage in service, the more you get realization, experience. And the more experience and realization you get, the more you want to engage in devotional service. That's why you heard Rupa Goswami's verse. If you're at all interested in mundane society, friendship and love, don't go see Govinda. Stay away from Gopina. <laughs> You'll forget all about your mundane goals. Obviously, he's recommending the opposite. Yes, forget your mundane goals by going to see Gopina. All right. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thanks a lot for your valuable association and the beautiful Krishna Katha. You mentioned how it's important to worship Deity at home, Gaurakita. And my question is that I can see that in this hall there are a lot of Indian devotees and I know that some of them are so lucky that they came from a uh, very high standard of life and some of devotees from India even have never had met uh, meet in their life because of Brahman culture. Uh, but in Western countries, people who are even worse than Shudra come from Krishna consciousness because of mercy of Srila Prabhupada. And you have been in Russia many times and in Ukraine. And you know that sometimes uh, one family member is devotee, but his partner or her partner eat meat or breaks principles. Something else. And my question is, uh, is it Diti Aparatha to invite Gauranitai for that place where one person or, for example, two family members are devotees, but there is still need in that place? Gauranitai accepts no offenses. As far as your description of the effects of the age of Kali, uh, it's everywhere these days. <laughs> I was speaking a few days ago about how at the new airport in Calcutta, when I would go to the gate to, before, to wait for the plane to arrive, I could usually go upstairs and there was nothing upstairs and I could chant Japa. 
Does anyone remember in Calcutta Airport when it was like that? What's upstairs now? Four pubs. <laughs> the Irish pub, the German pub. <laughs> so that was the end of my Jampa sanctuary. <laughs> so the age of Kali is everywhere. <laughs> if you're flying on Air India from Calcutta to Mumbai or Delhi, or flying on Vistara, whatever, indigo. You know what happens when the flight attendant comes around and says, veg or non-veg? <laughs> Everyone knows what happens, right? <laughs> so many persons, so proudly, non-veg. <laughs> so the age of Kali is everywhere. And as far as Worshipping Gordon's eye in a setting where not everyone is practicing bhakti. Well, you don't want to, even though Gordon's eye don't make offense, don't take offenses, you don't want to encourage persons to offend. So you keep those deities in your room or something like that. But the fact is, Gorn and Tai don't accept this offenses. Look at Nichananda and Jagaimada. You had a question. That'll be the last one before we break, because we don't want to hold up Prasadam. <laughs> <laughs> so, regarding the point Nama Kirtana, so it's both chanting and Kirtana, what exactly? Uh, uh, regarding Nama Kirtana, it means japa as well as kirtan. So both are equally. Both are nama kirtan. So they are equally important. Uh -huh. They are equally important, japa and kirtan. Both are important. You must chant your japa if you are an initiated devotee, and then an initiated devotee loves to participate in kirtan. Kirtan can refer to not simply Music, it can refer to speaking about Krishna, writing about Krishna. Okay? All right. Prashadam is ready in 10 minutes. We can do another One more question. All right, one more question. I've been told that Prasadam will be ready in 10 minutes. I know no one is interested. <laughs> This is the beautiful slash from the nectar of all. So I went, um, you mentioned like uh, Dhambasi, like uh, Matrabasi. So how long can we stay in Dham? You can make your own home a Dham if you are so Krishna conscious, like Bhakti Vinod Thakur. I always point out how Bhakti Vinod Thakur shows the peak potential of converting your home into a holy dam. He talks about it in his song, Shuddha Bhakata Chadanarenu Bhajana Anukula. He describes how one evening he was doing arti to his deities in his home and his whole house turned into Goloka Vrindavan. Now, of course, Bhakti no Thakur is no ordinary person. Still, he's showing you the potential in bhakti. And we'll talk about that in our next session. How you might think these descriptions of extraordinary bhakti are exaggerations that have no relevance for you. We'll talk about that in the afternoon. But my point is that yes, the potential is there to make your own home a spiritual abode. And then I describe how Srila Prabhupada pointed out that those who are absorbed in service at the Mandir, they're not in Melbourne or Sydney. They're in even what is beyond Vaikuntha. They're in Galoka Vrindavan because they're simply thinking how to satisfy Krishna. If they're thinking in that way, to whatever extent, 
to that extent they're in the spiritual world. So the spiritual world is not physical geography. It's not restricted by physical geography, shall we say. It is all about your consciousness. This is the principle of Vrindavan everywhere. Okay? Let me answer in another way that you don't have to have the brass deities, you can have a picture. There's nothing deficient about a picture. You can have a picture of Panchatapa, a picture of Shishi Gornitai. You can have the forms of Gornitai and a picture of Radha Gopina. But you sh we should be more aware that Radha Krishna worship is very high. Radha Krishna worship accepts no offenses. Excuse me, it doesn't tolerate offenses. It accepts all offenses. <laughs> That's why, as many of you know, in the temple, we worship Radha and Krishna according to the standard of Lakshmi Narayan in Vaikuntha, awe and reverence. Whereas Radha Krishna worship is actually Ragamar, spontaneous. Just like Sanatana Goswami used to keep his Radha Krishna deities in a tree. And he was a beggar, mendicant, so he would he would just offer the deity what he could, which was often just dry chapatis with no salt. And so one day the deity spoke to him, his Radha Krishna deities in the tree. Can you at least put some salt on the chapati? <laughs> And Sanatana Goswami replied, well, if I start endeavoring to get salt, then it will lead to, to endeavoring to get ghee and then this and that. The other will go on and on and on. Please, please, this is the best I can do. Please accept. And Krishna accepted. That's Raghavan. Don't imitate. <laughs> so there's no harm in your adding Gornitai. To your home altar. So if we make any offenses, uh, Gornitai will override the uh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing for Prasad? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Any last question? Yeah. Is there any last question? Way over here to the left. Thanks so much for this beautiful lesson. Uh, I have a question about chanting. Like when I chant, sometimes I feel that I am going into a different world. Like there are some powers that I feel while uh, I mean in the natural world. So like when you chant, you believe you have something powers coming from somewhere you don't know. But the point is, when you come back to the original world, this material world, those powers keep on diminishing step by step. So the point is how to maintain those powers after chanting while working within this material world so that, the, so that you can maintain a balance. So like... Chanting is simply for engaging in Krishna's service. You don't want mystic powers. <laughs> no, it's like not mystic power. That's what I believe that I'm getting some source of energy or something. 
Chanting is simply for pleasing Krishna. Oh Krishna, please engage me in your service. You appeal to Krishna, you appeal to the internal energy of Krishna, please engage me in your service. That's all that chanting is about. Still, if you want to chant for material benefit, that's better than not chanting at all. If you want wealth, if you want health, if you want psychic powers, still go ahead and chant Hare Krishna. Okay. It's, not, it's not about material benefits. It's about like you need to live, you need to live around with the people. You need to keep in contact with them. Do the yes, I certainly know yeah. that. It's, but I'm telling you that the proper chanting is simply for service. You're asking, give me, please. You can't demand. You say, my dear Krishna, if you so desire, please grant me devotional service. Now, to get to that point may take some time. So in the beginning, we may be chanting for material benefit. But go on chanting, and you'll become purified. So I'm glad that you are starting to chant Hare Krishna. You are the best among human beings. But there's a lot more for you to have. All right? All right, thanks. I